Singapore prides itself as a developed and industrialized nation. But that status goes beyond having a high standard of living, a vibrant economy and a democratic government. It is also important to have a truly open society with enlightened attitudes towards foreigners working and living amongst us. In our small country with limited resources, many are concerned about the ability of our infrastructure to support the expanding population, rising property prices caused by foreign investors and foreign students receiving government scholarships. From a global perspective, is overcrowding, competition for jobs and discomfort with social habits of foreigners in our midst unique to Singaporeans? What are the implications of our open door policy and the impact on social cohesion? Minister, thank you for hosting our recording of Let's Think About It. Hi, Gaitong. Thank you. Shall we uh, see the guests? Yep. In the previous two episodes, we looked at manpower and social issues arising from Singapore's intake of foreigners. In our final episode tonight, let's zoom out the lens and get a bigger picture of integration issues against a wider global context. Minister, could we have been more resolute in preserving our population status quo to maintain our place as a global city and economic hub? We have an economy which is almost the same size as Malaysia. So if you look at it as an engine, with a 3.8 million resident population, we have an economy that's $293 billion. Compared with Malaysia's 30 million and 313 billion, 355,000 square kilometers with a huge amount of resources compared with our 718 square kilometers. So we have created this big engine which produces a huge amount of wealth for our people in terms of housing, in terms of education, in terms of the ability to compete in the world, knowledge, knowledge economy, manufacturing, finance, good jobs. If you had cut back on immigration, that engine would not be like that. Your question in reverse terms, could we have had the same size engine producing the same amount of wealth for our people and same jobs and quality with less foreign manpower? The answer is no. Restructuring has a cost. 70% of our workforce depends on SMEs. They cannot expand. They are shrinking. Many of them are struggling because of manpower shortage. So we wouldn't have been able to catch the wind of economic growth and created the ecosystem within Singapore. We would have had to have a significant trade-off. And that would have social consequences in terms of employment. We could have cut back on immigration, but it would have had significant consequences in the medium and longer term. Do you think that in the last 10 to 15 years maybe, when it comes to letting the foreigners in, someone let the ball drop and let too many people in? There are strict criteria, but there are people who game the system. There are companies which are abused by bringing in a foreigner when they don't need to and when they could have promoted a local. So that happens. People game the system. People give us forged certificates. All those things happen. But in the main, if you bring in X thousand, that has a significant economic impact. I've had a bank coming to me and telling me in the 98, and subsequently in the 2008 crisis, they were cutting back throughout the world. But in Singapore, they created 6,000 jobs. The reason why they could create 6,000 jobs between 2009 and 2010 was because they went to the government and they said, we will create 6,000 jobs, 5,000 will go to Singaporeans, but you must allow me to bring 1,000 foreigners. IT professionals, people from Africa, people from other parts of Asia, are you prepared? Now, if we said no, there will be no 1,000 foreigners, but there will also be no 5,000 well-paying jobs in that bank for Singaporeans. So these are the trade-offs that we have to deal with every day. So our task is how do we make sure the policy works? If we don't catch the wind for our sale, we will miss the boat. I'll put it this way also, uh, King Yong. During that period, 
the greatest financial crisis the world has seen since the Second World War, the rest of the world was looking at unemployment figures in 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%. Can you imagine what it does to a person when they lose their jobs or they cannot get jobs? One quarter of the population, one in five. In Singapore, unemployment never went beyond 3%, 3.5%. And we came back to almost pretty much full employment very fast. Nevertheless, there is, of course, fear when a foreigner comes in. People fear for their jobs. And some people did lose their jobs. We must have a heart for them. We must say, how can we help our fellow Singaporeans? Any policy will help the majority but then there will be a minority who will be impacted. A few anecdotal examples. When I interviewed a Filipino nurse some years back in her little Topayo flat, I was astounded to see the number of people who just kept trickling out of the room. Grandparents, sister, brother, cousin, the whole village was there. Fast forward, another example of a lady from China who is a study mama. She was here with her child, so were her parents. And then there was my fitness coach from Philippines, both his kids, all his entire family is here too. And I was there scratching my head wondering, how did they get here? What is our policy like on the dependence? I would be very surprised if that nurse's family were given permanent residence or citizenship. Quite unlikely, because we are very strict on age criteria. If you are a nurse, you come in, even you would have difficulty getting permanent residence. So they can come as social visitors and then they'll have to go after a few months. Likewise, the other two examples you gave. Now, the fitness coach, depending on his age and depending on his income, if he was actually gainfully employed and is necessary, if there aren't enough people doing this sort of job, if he can show that, then his family would have been allowed to become permanent residents. But even there, we have cut back very substantially. Because when we take in somebody, it is not with the purpose of supporting him. He has got to support and contribute to the economy. But even with all those criteria, there have been hard caps that have been put in. And those caps have been tightened even further in the last six, seven years. So it's been consistently squeezed. So much so, if you go to our employers today, they are pretty angry with the government because they say, you are killing us. We can't survive in this environment. So there are trade-offs all the time, but I'm pretty sure that those examples you gave, those people would have been here, particularly the parents on social visit pass. What's your view about Singaporeans' ability to compete globally? I don't see why Singaporeans cannot compete. We are as good as any. Our main problem is there aren't enough of us. So the competitiveness at the individual level is high, but as a company, an SME, as a MNC, as an operation, is seriously impacted because we don't have enough people. We have to make sure that our people are given the skills to compete in the ever-changing economy. If we don't do that, then we'll become less competitive. But we are well-trained, but that's why we have Aspire. We want to make sure our entire population is able to be internationally competitive because if with a very small population base, each year the birth cohort now is 40,000, 30,000, it's coming down to 30 or 1,000, and you know, looks as if it might dip further. You are competing with how many millions coming out of China or each cohort, how many millions coming out of India and not counting Vietnam and other countries. So huge population bases, lots of talented people, hungry, and you need to compete against them. The other aspect for us is with our local population and foreign manpower. It produces a lot of wealth. But are we seeing a situation whereby these competitive Singaporeans are moving overseas, i.e. we are facing some kind of a brain drain situation because they are not happy that the foreigners are coming here, affecting the national identity, making the place overcrowded and also escalating property prices? We have to explain the trade-offs. What are the consequences? And then we have to choose. Do we choose much higher taxes, less vibrant economy, the possibility of higher unemployment, because those things will come if your economy downsizes. And your economy will downsize if you don't have investments coming in. Our own people going overseas, they feel a sense of identity crisis, though it doesn't quite make sense because here they are Singaporean in Singapore, in the majority. They go overseas, and very much the minority, when there are opportunities. When you take a company, if it's growing in China, 
the rates of growth in China and India are very different from the rate of growth in Singapore. So often many people look at that and take opportunities. And we have to be prepared for that. In the 80s and 90s, we were worrying about our people going to Silicon Valley. We just can't compete with those kinds of opportunities. And the only answer to that is make ourselves competitive, attractive for people to stay and create a good system. Property prices, you take any top city in the world, at least in Singapore, unlike New York or London or Hong Kong, you have the ability to own your flat. 50% of Hong Kong owns their own properties. And even those who own their own properties pay more for less. Here, you are 30, engaged, you're pretty much guaranteed a flat. Doesn't happen anywhere else in the world.